What is up guys? Wrestling Premiere is here. This one in particular, uh, I, I kind of forgot about it. Didn't think about it much until last week. I was like, you know what? We gotta start work on this. We need to do another lower card star. You know, we gotta talk about somebody. This man went from a brutally violent individual who dissected his opponent to a pirate to an aggressive man that comes out with his sister. He's had quite the gimmicks. Now, Paul Burchill doesn't get the credit he deserves for being a good wrestler. He's actually a great technical wrestler as well as a good promo. And you see all of this, you question why WWE didn't push him. But enough talk, I'll get into that later. Let's get into it. So as I said, Paul Burchill was a damn good wrestler. Down in FWA, Frontier Wrestling Alliance, the man trained with the company's academy. He excelled and turned out to be their version of Goldberg. He was obliterating the opposition, winning their world title, and before he knew it, WWE came calling. He was sent down to OBW before officially debuting on the main roster in August of 2005. Now, Burchell was initially paired with William Regal. Alright, he debuted on the August 27th episode of Velocity. He made his actual in-ring debut later that week on SmackDown, on destroying Funaki and Sky to Too Hot. He displayed a style for everybody to see, you know, he was a calculated yet extremely aggressive individual. It's like he enjoyed beating up talent, and this is exactly what he said the following week, you know, he enjoyed beating up talent. He even went as far as to say he used to hurt people for pleasure, but nowadays it's for money. But before he knew it, he was starting to take L's like everybody else. One of those matches saw Lashley beat both Burchell and Regal in a handicap match. The duo then realized in storyline, hey, we're better off alone. And so on the February 3rd, 2006 episode of SmackDown, Paul Burchell and William Regal went their separate ways. They didn't want to team up again. And Burchell's talking about heritage or whatever before Palmer Cannon asked him, where's your heritage trace back? And from out of nowhere, he's like, it traces back to Blackbeard. And he's talking about pirates. And Regal is very confused as was the network executive. Burchill explained things, and Regal was at a loss of words. Like, what was this guy saying? Like, look at the look on his face. And Cannon loved this idea. Why? Well, because he was so damn infatuated with weird gimmicks that get you nowhere above the lower card at the time. Like, if we're talking in the storyline. He had a bunch of those on SmackDown. And Regal's like, can you imagine if he came from a long line of proctologists? Now, how did it reach the point where WWE decided to turn a quote-unquote from Regal, hooligan, yeah, he used to call Paul Burchell a hooligan, to a pirate. In a WWE.com interview, Burchell spoke about the creation of the whole pirate thing. And I quote, I went to Mr. McMahon and he said, you're going to be a pirate, like from Pirates of the Caribbean. I said, okay, so you want me to be like Keith Richards? He said, yes, but dressed like a pirate. It's funny that seems to be what defines my career. People are like, oh, the pirate, and some are like, that poor guy, he had to do it. I would do it right now. I loved it. A week later, Captain Jack Sparrow showed up. He left Mr. Kennedy and Palmer Cannon perplexed. Kennedy thought this was all a joke and ended up in an awkward situation. He was telling Burchill everything he wanted to hear and even said, we need a pirate in this business. William Regal was anything but proud and even brought in a few letters from the UK. He wanted about how this made him look badly, but all he could do is hand him a bomb. Yup. Even though Paul was extremely serious about this, Regal still tried to change his mind. He responded telling William that he's debuting like this in all his glory and if it were up to him, he would be his opponent. Yeah, about that while well, his wish was granted. Before the match went down, Regal told the fans to try not to laugh before calling him all kinds of things, and the entrance itself, every time, it's like Burchill's insinuating, I know, it's a crazy gimmick. Before jumping down to the ground with a damn rope, the commentary thought it was cool, whereas Regal was laughing his ass off, and the man was all in on his character. He was throwing out all kinds of beads, bringing out a sword, everything was there. You know, he was fully focused on making this thing work. His debut match went pretty well. Regal's no slouch though, and it took a lot of work. Also, this was when he debuted that ridiculous C4 finisher. The way that move looks in SVR 2007 is just so damn outlandish. William Regal grew extremely frustrated with Burchill's life choices and brought him a proper attire. It didn't matter to Burchill. He's undefeated since becoming a pirate and he refused to change. He ended up challenging Regal to a winner dressed as a loser match, and as expected, Burchill scored the W and so he forced William to wear all kinds of things, but soon enough it was Burchill who turned into a jobber. You see, he was starting to lose quickly and to make matters worse, he suffered a knee injury. So Mark Henry annihilated him straight to the shelf. With Burchill out, he risked his spot on the card and this is something he said himself. He said that checking if that knee was injured was a huge risk. Now there's some conflicting reports as to why the gimmick ended. Some say it's because uh, he got injured. Some say it was because McMahon didn't know what Pirates of the Caribbean was. And according to Burchill, it's because Disney got involved. So I'm just going to go with that one. The whole pirate thing was very random, but I kind of like it. It's not the best utilization of Burchill's skills at all, of course. But I can't say I'm not entertained when looking back on it. In the interviews I've seen, Burchill himself loved it, but it didn't seem to last that long. Like, for being the defining run of his career, it legit lasted about four months. 
Upon Burchell's return, he began wearing a mask in OVW and was called the Ripper. With this new character, he found success capturing the OVW World Championship four times and was also paired with Katie Burchell. Soon enough, about two years later, Burchell found himself on the main roster once again. This time though, his girl Katie Lee, yeah, she was now his sister. Now, if you're like me watching wrestling as a kid, you didn't read the room. It obviously flew over my head, but Katie was supposed to be with Paul, you know? I don't know why they booked this whole thing, but they did it anyways, and there was always an interest in booking this sort of storyline in the 2000s. On the February 11th, 2008 episode of Raw, Paul Burchell made his re-debut. Right off the bat, you're thinking, that's his girl. With how close they were, she grabbed the mic and called this a special night before presenting Burchell. She even called him the most beautiful man in the world, and Katie then said that the thing that makes her happy the most is him inflicting damage to others. His opponent was Brian Kendrick. Immediately began working the arm, Jerry Lawler on commentary mentioned the obvious, that being Katie's love and enamoration towards Paul, you know, it's kind of odd. And Kendrick did put up a fight, but it was no match for Burchell's brutality. The duo seemed to insinuate everybody was looking at them weird for being together, but they attributed that for having good family genes. And I agree with JR, like, when the hell did we see a brother and sister duo in WWE? But anyways, Burchell was smashing his opponents into oblivion with his vicious, no-nonsense offense. But he didn't get to do much though, he wasn't on the Wrestlemania 24 card, he wasn't featured on any pay-per-view, and even if he were to face somebody, it would be somebody along the lines of super crazy. Until the May 26, 2008 episode of Raw, why? Because after Mr. Kennedy's match with William Regal, he attacked. Why did he do this? Because Kennedy got rid of William Regal, and because of this he had made an enemy out of the Burchells. Paul told Kennedy straight up, there's gonna be repercussions. He followed up the next week with a similar attack, but Kennedy though, finally bounced back later that night to send Paul running. This of course led to a matchup between the two and as expected, or not, I don't know, Mr. Kennedy emerged victorious. After the match, Katie Lee scolded Kennedy and even slapped him and this proved to benefit Burchell greatly as he capitalized with the twisted sister. The feud was somewhat intense but didn't last that long because Kennedy was drafted to SmackDown. Nonetheless, he got the chance to beat him in a mixed tag team match. Kennedy failed to score the W as Katie Lee pinned Mickey James and so he was off to Friday nights. Soon enough, Paul Burchell set his sights on the Intercontinental Championship. He sends Kofi Kingston a message ahead of their title match the following week, and I should note that this match was impromptu. It wasn't like Burchell knew the match was on in storyline. The challenger was up to the task, you know, he was much more intense and violent than Kofi, but ultimately, the champion was in form and he retained the title. Also, one thing to mention is that Katie Lee was feuding with Mickey James at the same time, and so they eventually faced off in a tag team match. This time, since it was non-title, Burchell actually pinned Kofi, giving him yet another title shot two weeks later. Once again, he took the L when it matters the most, and from here on, he turned into a glorified jobber. He took L's to the likes of Batista, Jamie Noble, and singles and tag team action, and with regards to that whole sibling storyline, according to Burchill himself, the WWE went PG and canceled the plans they had for it. He started appearing less frequently until he abruptly showed up on ECW. You'd think it'd get better here, but he was actually treated better on Raw. For the most part, the matches were actually competitive, but he was losing at the end of the day. It took a while for him to actually feud with somebody, and when the time came, it turned out to be his first and last feud in ECW. On the August 11th, 2009 episode of ECW, Gregory Helms interviewed Paul Burchell. Now, for some odd reason, Burchell refused to let Helms interview him and even claimed that Gregory was the Hurricane. Yep, he just wanted to do his job, but then Burchell randomly struck him. Later that night, the Hurricane came in and attacked, and now for some reason, I don't know why this was happening, Helms was claiming to be a separate entity from the Hurricane. But anyways, this marked the beginning of their feud. This led to a match between the two the following week, and the match itself was fairly competitive, you know, no man was outright dominating, but in his return to match, Hornswoggle, Hornswoggle, Hurricane scored the W. Burchell didn't really think much about this loss because he had a rematch on Superstars, and the man just flat out refused to call him the Hurricane and promised that Thursday is a different story. About that, yes, Paul Burchell was victorious. I can't even see a clip of it, you know, to talk about it properly. But yes, he scored that W. Later that week on ECW, Abraham Washington hosted his own talk show. After almost endlessly speaking about himself, insulting the city of Cleveland, he introduced his guest, Gregory Helms. Washington wanted to stir up drama, so he brought in Paul Burchell as well. Once more, he called Helms a fraud and an embarrassment. This is all because Paul felt that his intelligence had been insulted. Suddenly, Hurricane responded on the Titan Tron promise to return next week, and he also challenged him to a match. The man was incensed, but he accepted. 
about this match it was pretty damn good they had enough time to construct a decent enough match virtual was pulling out all kinds of moves to best hurricane like this bam bam slam but for the hundredth time hurricane caught him with the eye and won it nonetheless paul he still had another reason for hating hurricane he was nitpicking obviously saying since hurricane's a superhero then why didn't he save katie last week so that's why i attacked him again Hemsworth was still playing the games you know one moment he's hurricane the next he's an ordinary person so a rematch was on the horizon this time though, Birchall dominated for the most part and ended up beating him clean. And it seemed like the feud was over because he felt good about beating the Hurricane slash Gregory Helms, but still didn't understand why the fans gravitated towards somebody like him. Nonetheless, he was happy about exposing the fraud that is the Hurricane. So now that he scored the W, he wanted Helms to admit that he's the better man. Helms comes out and Paul says to him, lies are gonna wash away and the truth shall set you free. He unmasked, but it was actually an imposter. Everyone emerged from behind with a stick. He delivered a few lashes to send him running. Realizing this was never going to end, Birchall offered a proposition. One more match next week. That's all he wanted. And Helms confirmed the Hurricane will be there. Now, for some reasons, Paul didn't even make good on that challenge. Once again, he refused to accept that Hurricane was a superhero. He was like, oh, what about me? He's talking about how he's talented, educated, intelligent, yet they still don't look up to him. Hurricane responded saying, you call the fans mindless, soulless freaks and maybe they just want to have fun. He also mentioned that the girls like superheroes. And that proposal that Birch was talking about was huge. If Hurricane loses, he unmasks and exposes himself as the hoax he is. But if Hurricane wins, Birch will promise that he'll quit ECW. He accepted and the match is on. If there's one match, one match of Paul Birchall's you should watch, this is the one. Let me talk about it quickly to explain why. So basically, the stakes made both guys super resilient. Especially the Hurricane because Birch was intense. He was desperate to wrap things up and he was eating him up inside and of course the whole risking the career thing shows that. He was throwing everything in the kitchen sink, he was hitting his finisher that jackhammer, but the Hurricane was kicking out. He was showing hard, taking high risk moves and with that neck breaker off the top, he was victorious. The match was everything that it needed to be in. It's a very enjoyable bout. The Birchals couldn't exactly comprehend how this was possible. They just had a look of shock on their face. And even though Paul agreed to the stipulation, he was desperate to come back and was still calling Hurricane a fraud. Tiffany told him there's no way back and so he reverted to being the Ripper once again. Tiffany obviously didn't buy this, but in Birchall's eyes, Paul Birchall was the one who agreed to the stipulation, not the Ripper. So he's playing the Hurricane game. The one thing he endlessly criticized him for months about he was doing the exact same thing. Luckily for himself, the GM gave him a match with the Hurricane. Also, I should mention that KD Lee was now a beautiful nightmare. If he wins, he signs to ECW. Yeah, about that, he screwed up again. The Ripper took control early on and dominated for the most part, but then Hurricane unmasked him, hit the Shining Wizard, and that's all she wrote. I love how when desperate times called for desperate measures, Virgil hypocritically did the same exact thing that he was fighting against. With the loss, Paul and KD Lee were gone from ECW. At the time, there was re reports on the internet stating that those two were coming back to Raw. Katie Lee did return, but Paul on the other hand didn't. Instead, on February 26, 2010, Paul Virtual was released from his WWE contract. Now, you'd think WWE were the ones who let him go, but it turns out Paul asked for and was granted his release saying, I went home and said to my wife, I don't want to go back and be like, I'm the guy that so-and-so needs to beat that week. I hadn't felt like a priority in a long time. The boss will love your work, but you're not a priority, so you kind of get left by the wayside. I was like, I don't think I want to go there and do that. I made a decision and I went to women and said I'd like to finish up and two weeks later they called me. I knew a year before what I'd do after. I made sure I was smart about it and I had a plan. So there you have it. Nowadays I believe Birchall's a firefighter. He's not doing bad at all. In my personal opinion, I'm baffled as to how they didn't have a spot for him. It's pretty confusing to me because for one, he had the size, you know, he was pretty damn believable. He looked intimidating, executed moves that looked pretty unique and brutal. He also had the in-ring skill, was capable of being a freak of nature, and he also had the mic skills. Paul was capable of speaking comfortably, and when you look at all of this, you're thinking, how? How did he have a comfortable position in the card? That's what I thought of Birchall. I didn't really pay attention to him much as a kid. He was just there, but man, he wasn't bad at all. Alright, what did you guys think of Paul Birchall? Please comment down below. That's it for this video. Make sure you hit the C4 on the like button, and perhaps the Twisted Sister on the subscribe button. Peace, I'm out.